I'm Meredith Niles. I'm an assistant professor in nutrition and food science. Just started my second year here at UVM. Um, a little background on me. I am a pretty multidisciplinary scientist. I also teach in the food systems program on campus. So I have a background in political science for undergraduate and then a PhD in ecology and a postdoctorate in sustainability science. And now I'm in a nutrition department. Mm -hmm. um, so I realize that's a really complex path. Um, but I consider myself sort of an interdisciplinary food systems researcher and I particularly study climate change and food security and then why and how farmers adopt uh, different kinds of practices and technologies. So you'll see a little bit of that in my talk today, but I want to thank the library for organizing um, for Open Access Week and for this presentation. And I'm really going to talk a lot about um, some of my own experiences as a non-tenured early career uh, faculty mem member and uh, as someone who's been involved in open access for oh about seven years now um, and even though I didn't know it beforehand probably before that as well um, and just some of my own experiences and, and also talk a little bit about some of the myths I think that I've heard about open access and my own perception and what research suggests about those myths that I don't think are true about open access. So um, we're gonna have two other shorter presentations after mine, um, but I'm happy to take questions along the way if there's anything to clarify, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end as well for conversation. So um, just to give you a sense of my sort of roadmap, can everybody see this okay? Should we dim? We're good? Okay. So we gotta start by at least making sure we all have a common definition. So what is open access? I'm going to talk a little bit about how I actually came to be so involved in this um, and how I really uh, made it a point of sort of my academic career to be someone who promotes open access. Um, and then talk about what is the current state of publishing and what's changing. A lot of things are happening both in policy and in funding right now about open access. And I think it's really important um, to you know, be aware of that, especially as faculty members. Dig through some myths and then also talk a little bit how I feel like being someone who promotes open access and makes my work open access has really helped my career actually. Um, so before I get started I just wanted to get a sense of the people in the room. So how many of you are from or affiliated with the library? I think a lot of you probably. Okay and any graduate students or undergraduate students? Okay a couple. Faculty members? Great. Thank you. At least one more here. And something different? I didn't see you raise your hand in the blue. Are you a different affiliation? No. no. Okay. Great. Well, we got a little bit of a diversity. A lot of library people. That's okay. Um, okay. So last year, Science Magazine, um, they did a, a survey. And the survey was, why did you become a scientist? And researchers tweeted about this. They had a hashtag. And I think some of the responses um, help set the tone for the theme of my talk today. So some of them are a little funny, right? This one um, person <laughs> said, you know, she collects dead bugs, it makes it less creepy. Um, but a lot of other people talked about changing the world, right? It's awesome to have a role in changing the world for the better, the potential to make someone live longer, people working on public health work in particular. I love the satisfaction of discovery. Um, I love asking questions. I've learned about the power of perseverance, trying to solve currently incurable diseases. I want to help find a cure for Alzheimer's, something that affects my family personally. A life is not important except the impact it has on other lives, a quote by Jackie Robinson. And I think science could lead to a better world. What else? So the overwhelming number of these responses were about people wanting to change the world, wanting to do science and research for public good. And I think um, as I have considered open access and the potential benefits I think it has, this is a good sort of starting place to frame and a little bit of the theme of my talk. So what actually is open access? There's you know, a lot of misperceptions out there, a lot of confusion about how and when it started, what is it? So open access is free, immediate, online access to scientific and scholarly articles with full reuse rights. This is the strongest definition of open access. As you'll hear throughout my talk today, there's a lot of other efforts that make work publicly available 
um, but maybe aren't necessarily immediate, for example, through repositories or other examples out there. Um, but the free part and the online part is really important. And this definition stems from um, the Budapest Open Access Initiative and the Berlin Declaration on Open Access. And this is what the Budapest Open Access Initiative said in 2002. They said, an old tradition and a new technology have converged to make possible an unprecedented public good. So the old tradition is that scientists and scholars publish and they spend their life's work to do this. And the new thing is the internet. Right, so open access really is a movement as a result of the internet. The internet made it possible to share information in ways that we never were able to before, right? We literally had to bind copies of journals, send them out, that was the only way we could read this information. That, that sort of publishing model made sense, it was what we had. The internet changed that potential to communicate about science in different ways. And the Berlin Declaration, which was a year later in 2003, uh, which I would note also was about both the sciences and the humanities, said, we've drafted the Berlin Declaration to promote the internet as a functional instrument for a global scientific knowledge base and human reflection. So these are really the two sort of seminal um, or open access moments, 2002, 2003. And since then, we've seen a growth in open access journals and people publishing open access. And as the internet became you know, more and more powerful, and reaching farther parts of the globe, it made it even more possible to actually have open access. OK, so now that we have that common de definition, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I wound up getting here today and giving you a talk about open access and why you might care at all what I have to say. Um, so this is my open story, I call it. So this is a photo of me circa 2007, almost 10 years ago. And I lived in D.C. at the time. I was post-college, pre-grad school. I took four years off. And I worked for an environmental nonprofit organization. And I had a new job there. And I was designing this new campaign we were trying to start on climate change and food systems. So trying to educate people about the impact of what they eat and how it has an environmental impact and may influence climate change. And it was meant to be a research-driven campaign. It was really meant to be grounded on the best available science about what we knew about agriculture and different kinds of food production um, technologies. So you'll notice in this picture, it, I'm actually reading a scientific paper. It's my lunch break, and I'm reading the scientific paper. I found this photo a couple of years ago. I was like, oh, this is perfect. I personally experienced, as not a member of a university, an inability to get this research. And I didn't really realize at the time that this was sort of a problem. Um, I mean, I knew it was a problem because I was trying to create a research-based, scientifically grounded program and was having to email authors, beg for copies, hope they'd be on Google somehow, and was really sort of trying to scrape together these options because I wasn't at a university anymore. So that topic was one that was so interesting to me, I decided to pursue that for my graduate degree. Um, so my first year of my PhD, I did my PhD at UC Davis. My first year of my PhD, um, this is still kind of personal, not quite research yet. Um, my cousin was diagnosed with a very rare brain tumor. And it was 2009, and the uh, National Institutes of Health had just launched a couple of years prior their PubMed Central, which was their repository for research. And it was, you know, it was, I'm happy to say my cousin's doing great and, you know, he's doing really well, but it was a really scary time for my family. And I was the only one at a university, but a lot of the rest of my family was able to use PubMed Central to better access research about my cousin's condition. And that was sort of the first time I experienced the benefit that could have for, for like real people, right, to actually have access to these articles and to be able to see them. Um, and then I started doing my own research, and so I work with farmers a lot, um, hence this picture. And um, I work in, I did my PhD work in New Zealand and California, and this is a New Zealand photo that I took, a farmer early morning. And this is a farmer in California that I've worked with. And as I started to have my own research uh, get, you know, published and come out, I started to realize that the population of people who could most benefit from reading it, farmers, wouldn't actually be able to read it without paying for it. And I had this moment where I thought, oh, 
okay, you know, I could send them the articles, but I only know so many farmers in the Central Valley of California, um, so maybe I should think about how and where I publish it. So I published my first chapter of my PhD in PLOS One, um, and then I can't honestly say I published all of my chapters open access. There are other factors at play when you're a graduate student, um, but I did, I did make all of them open in some way, as I'll talk about later. And that was in part because I started to realize the people I worked with wouldn't have access to the material. And um, in part because of this, all of this stuff, I became very interested in advocacy on this issue. And um, given my political background, that I sort of went to that option because I had training in political science. And so I became the um, legislative affairs director for the National Graduate Student Association across the United States when I was a graduate student. And uh, this is one of our lobbying days that we had or, uh, organized on Capitol Hill. We brought together, in total the year I was um, director, 120 students from all over the country to go and meet with their legislators in Congress and talk about federal research funding. Um, and we also um, met with legislators. This is Senator Boxer from California. And we talked about open access. So our organization was really interested in having graduate students promote open access, um, in part because a lot of them weren't going to stay in academia and they wanted better access to materials for pursuing you know, business ventures and going into public health and, uh, and other things. So we were supporting um, FASTER, which was a federal legislation to try to make the results of publicly funded research at the federal level open access. And I'll talk a little bit more about what has happened with that effort. Um, and we also worked uh, at the state level. So in California in 2014, um, right as I was finishing my PhD, California passed its first state level policy on open access to state funded research. And this said that if you receive funding from the state of California for public health research, they were sort of emulating what the National Institutes of Health had done, you're required to put the results, those, those publications, into a public repository one year after publication. So that embargo period uh, helps safeguard some of the publishers to continue to have access to their revenue, but also makes it publicly available. Now that one year period, as we I mentioned about the definition, official definition of open access, this is where you start to see those differences because it wasn't immediate, but a year's better than nothing, <laughs> I would argue. And I think it's also really important to point out from a policy perspective, this is a very bipartisan issue. So both the federal legislation and the state legislation that passed in California were uh, bipartisan, sponsored by both Democrats and Republicans. They have different interests in why they'd like to see this, but um, that makes it a lot easier to talk to people about this. You know, when, when you say it's bipartisan in today's current time, uh, that may, means something. So there's a lot of support behind this. Um, we also, when I was at the UC, uh, is when they passed their open access policy. They recently, after I left, extended it to also include graduate students, um, which was something I had tried to advocate for when I was there, which was really exciting. And then um, I've also tried to do this in my own work. So um, this was my first chapter of my dissertation, which was published in PLOS One. I've also published in some hybrid journals. I'll talk a little bit about what that means later. But you see it right here, right? Copyright the authors, right? So it's, it's the retention of that copyright for you, the writer, not over to the journal. And we'll talk more about that too. And then finally, just a, a note about open data, which is not something we're going to talk a lot about today, but open data actually was a, a really important thing for my life as well because I did all of my postdoctorate work on an open data set. So this was a data set gathered um, through the CGIR program, the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Program. They had an um, international data set, 15 countries, with smallholder farmers looking at food security and climate change. And so as a result of that, I was able to help them analyze it um, and not have to go to 15 countries and gather all my own data, but, uh, which doesn't happen in a one-year postdoc, let me tell you. Um, but it was, you know, this was another moment in my life that just really helped me understand how open data could also be really valuable and help people um, better understand it. And now I'm here. And I'm really excited to be here in part because I think um, the land grant mission is one that aligns itself really well with thinking about open access. You know, we, we work at an institution who's meant to serve the public and meant to serve our state. 
Um, UC Davis was one as well, and, and I really value that, and I think open access is a helpful way to think about how we can do that. Okay, so moving back into sort of what's going on, what is open access? So after the, you know, the Berlin and the Budapest Declaration, 2002, 2003, we've got the internet, right? It can make information more publicly available, but despite the fact that the internet, as I'll show you in a minute, has actually helped make publishing cheaper, we can't see the red super well, but maybe you can see this red line here. So what this says is serial expenditures. So those of you in the library probably have experienced this, right? Um, I'm sure you can talk about it way more than I can. So this is um, 1986 and all the way up to 2010, and that number says plus 402%. So obviously some of this gain happens, you know, prior to open access, prior to the internet, but a lot of it has happened after we've had opportunities to make publishing a little bit cheaper through using the internet and through having online journals and not always printing everything tangibly, right? And that has, you know, we live in America, so people make money, um, but that has had an impact on publishers. So publishers, as library expenses have gone up, publishers have also been able to make a lot of profit off of this. Um, and it's lots of publishers, it's not just one, right? So the publishers here I highlighted in red, and this is data from 2008, so it's a little bit old, it's from MIT libraries. But in that year, Springer was at a 37% profit margin, Elsevier 32%, um, and these are numbers that have continued in that direction. So. You know, it's America. We could argue we want companies to make money and provide jobs to people. I think the, the challenge for a lot of uh, people is, is this one, right? Is this idea that 80% of the world's academic research is funded by the taxpayers, right? It's funded by public money, and then it gets printed in private journals and then sold back to the people who paid for it. So this is where open access is trying to re-envision what this model might look like. In part, and, and one of the things I'm most passionate about is this, is that you know, it's people pay and, and they invest in science and they invest in us. And um, for me, and this is a message that resonates really well when we meet with Republican lawmakers in particular, is that is that an efficient use of, of money? If we're you know, giving people funding publicly and then printing it in private journals and trying to sell it back to the public. So this is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. And I can say that things are really starting to change. Um, so this actually happened when I was at Harvard for my postdoctorate. And Harvard came out and said they can no longer afford journals publisher prices. And like everybody had a little bit of a laugh at this because really it's Harvard, like they have this crazy endowment, you know. But um, Harvard has been very much on the forefront of promoting open access. And this is what their director of the library said. He said the system is absurd and it is inflicting terrible damage on libraries. We simply cannot go on paying the increase in subscription prices. In the long run, the answer will be open access journal publishing, but we need concerted effort to get to that goal. Um, so, you know, there was a little bit of like, come on Harvard, you can probably pay for the journals, but when Harvard says they can't pay for the journals, I think some people started to pay attention to that. And I was there at the time, and, and Harvard has a great open access repository and is, um, doing a lot to try to promote open access among their faculty in particular. Other things that have happened, there's been um, some uh, recent articles that have come out. This was in Nature in 2013, and they actually did a breakdown to say, okay, you know, what I just mentioned, this idea that the internet was supposed to make things a little bit cheaper and easier, and through their assessment, that is exactly what they found. They, you know, they found that this subscription that has both print and online journals roughly cost $4,800, whereas the subscription online only is $3,500, and the open access online only is about $2,200. You know, the key question, of course, here is who's paying for it, right? In this model, we're often having the libraries pay for it and the institutions pay for it, and sometimes on this end, it's often the author themselves that would be paying the open access charges. Um, so this helped at least to identify that we are paying more for certain types of journals, and to make that a little bit clear. We're also seeing some changes in government. Um, so 2002, 2003, sort of the original um, open access efforts. 2009, that year that I told you that my cousin um, was diagnosed with his 
brain tumor was exactly when they fully instituted um, their open access policy at the National Institutes of Health. So what that means is that if you receive funding from the National Institutes of Health, you're required to put any peer-reviewed journal articles that you've published into their repository um, up to one year after publication. And PubMed Central, their uh, open access repository, also pulls other open access articles from throughout um, the internet. And they put them in here. So for example, I'll show you later, one of my publications also is linked into PubMed Central because it was made open access. So it's another way of people finding your work. But actually, this is really now starting to happen in all federal agencies. And I know this is something that um, Elizabeth and others could talk to you more about. I think as faculty members, it's really important that we understand what's changing. In 2013, the White House directed that any federal agency funding more than $100 million in research a year come up with a public access plan, meaning they were required to figure out essentially how to do what N the NIH had done. How do we give people, taxpayers, the public access to the articles published through taxpayer money? And that's actually starting to happen now. So the USDA public access policy um, just is in its final phases of being launched out, and it's going to be called Pub Ag. And so I, for example, got a USDA grant this year. Any peer-reviewed articles that come from that will be required to be deposited into the Department of Agriculture repository as part of um, my grant funding. And they also have the 12 months embargo. NSF, another big uh, source of funding, obviously, they have the same thing. They launched theirs in October 2015, and they populated it to start with 10,000 full text journal articles. Um, and they're using the same technology uh, developed by the Department of Energy. So there's a lot of good efficiencies happening in this policy where not every single um, agency is making their own repository. A lot of them are using the same technology and platform that's already been developed and just populating it with their collections of work. And the other place where this is happening is actually from private funders and foundations. Um, so the Gates Foundation is the most significant one. Um, this was from, I think, 2014. Yeah. 2014, the Gates Foundation announced the world's strongest policy on open access. So anyone that receives funding from the Gates Foundation is required to put their articles in, not even a repository, they have a zero embargo period, which means that you cannot publish in a journal that doesn't allow for an open access free and immediate. They've fully embodied the full definition. And what that means actually is that people who get funded by the Gates Foundation, they can't, you know, they can't put their work in science, they can't put their work in nature, sell, some pretty big, you know, important impact factor journals are off limits according to their policy. They are covering the costs of the, um, uh, the fees associated with some of these journals, and they have a whole platform they've built and developed. But Bill and Melinda Gates, they're technology people, their entire foundation is built around um, development and the developing world, and especially a lot of public health and diseases. And they said, this is too important and this work is too important for people, especially in the developing world, not to have access to it. And so this was the policy they adopted. The Ford Foundation um, taking a similar stance um, not long after them in 2015. And then this is showing um, policies adopted by quarter. So these are open access policies, and there's different colors here. So the light blue is a research organization. The blues are funders. So you can see over time, this goes through 2016. Over time, there are more funder policies as well as research organization policies coming out um, around the world. So this is increasingly common. It's increasingly common that if you're a faculty member to get funding, um, especially if it's private foundation or public funding, you will have to do something with open access. So what are those things you can do and what are some of the myths that are still out there? So I have three I'm gonna focus on. And the first one is this idea that there is no peer review in open access journals. How many of you have heard that or maybe thought that? Yes, that's okay, you can say that. <laughs> I, you know, fully, fully understood. Okay, so I think this is, you know, th this has happened for a number of reasons. One of the big ones was um, something that happened in 2013. So in 2013, um, science did sort of this experiment, we'll call it, where they wrote a fake paper. 
they wrote a fake paper. It was a chemistry-oriented paper, and it was fake enough that basically anyone who had sort of any experience in chemistry, if they read it, would be like, wow, this is garbage, right? That was sort of their intention, right? Let's make it super obvious this is a terrible paper and see what happens. So they submitted the fake paper to 304 open access journals. What do you think happened? How many do you think accepted it? 275? Five. Five. I like your optimism. It's nice. <laughs> Sorry? Almost, Almost all of them? Yeah, other guesses? 25. 25? Okay, well, it's sort of in the middle. 157 of them accepted it, right? So this is bad. <laughs> like, that's bad. Like, let's not deny that that's a problem, right? I'm not standing up here, like, evangelizing about, oh, open access is the only, you know, solution. But the problem, there's a key problem. Anybody? Thoughts on what's the key problem with this sort of experiment they did? Well, did they submit it to non-open access journals? No. So they didn't have a control. So I'm a scientist. <laughs> you know, we, we don't know if you had submitted it to other journals, if also 157 of them would have accepted it or if none would have accepted it, or if more would have accepted it, right? So that's a problem, right? We shouldn't have 157 journals accepting a clearly bad paper, but we also don't have a metric of, is peer review just sort of broken in general, or is it only a problem with open access journals, right? So um, I do want to acknowledge that there are ways to protect yourself, right? We all get these crazy emails all the time about, like, I, you know, I get invited to be an editor of a new journal like every week, and I'm not—I e don't even have tenure, you know. I'm like, guys, I shouldn't be editing someone's journal, you know. I'm new, um, but there are those predatory open access journals out there, right? And so, the, when people talk about open access in this way, it is a very different story from the original intent of open access. And what's happened is essentially, if you charge people money to publish somewhere that a lot of these journals sprung up to try to make money. A lot of them are based in India um, and Asia in particular, and there is a way to protect yourself, and I think it's really important for academics and scholars to know this. So if you want to publish in an open access journal, I would advise that you check that it's not on this list that has been um, is heavily updated about that, and also if you receive invitations to review or to be editors, anything like that, check this list. You know, make sure that you're not participating in that system inadvertently. Um, so this is a really good resource. Um, it's been helpful for me because I'm not always sure. And um, I think there's also other things that are happening that can help this more than, um, than we've talked about in, in the field. And this is about a movement to make peer review more transparent. So if the problem, if there's an assumption that open access journals don't have good peer review, first of all, the experiments that have been done to demonstrate that, I think there's problems with them, as we just talked about. But I think a, a better option is if peer review is a problem, it's probably a problem for a lot of journals and not just open access journals. And if we make the process more transparent, then we really can see what's going on, right? What does this process actually look like? So that's actually happening with um, a number of journals. So a lot of journals, not a lot, but a number of journals have, have moved to actually publishing the reviews and making those open alongside with a finalized article. They're typically anonymous still. I think the authors have the right to make them public if they want. But this is an example of what it looks like. So eLife is a journal in the life sciences. They're a fully open access journal. And um, they publish the reviews, right? So here's the decision letter. Here's an author response. And I think this is really powerful for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, there's a lot that happens in that back and forth that's potentially really valuable to understand as a researcher, especially as an early career researcher, to understand how manuscripts evolve and change and what the feedback is that people receive. Um, I think it's also great that, you know, if there's a record out there and you're willing to sign your name to it, you can actually be known for performing scientific work and potentially receiving credit for that work that you do. Um, and a lot of journals have moved in this direction. Um, pr some pretty notable ones, including the British Medical Journal. Um, so this is a trend that I think is starting. And, and to me, this is a better option for dealing with 
peer review and really acknowledging what's happening in peer review across all journals, not just in open access journals, which could also be a problem. I'm not denying that you know, it could be a problem in lots of journals. So, so this one um, is a myth that I hear a lot about. So the second one is this open access is expensive myth. And this is obviously what I pointed out earlier, that, OK, when you really look apples apples across the systems, in fact, open access online journals can be cheaper on average. This is on average, right? The question really is about who's paying, right? So for a lot of authors, they really feel like, wow, this is super expensive to me because I have to pay the article processing charge, right? The $1,500 or the $2,000. Um, and there are places that are trying to shift those models where libraries are necessarily, um, they're, they're not buying as many subscriptions and they're like allocating some of that money to help their faculty actually pay for article processing charges. At UC Davis, they had, the library had a fund to help their graduate students and faculty publish open access. That's how I paid for my PLOS One my first year. Yeah. Oh, I just had a very quick question. Sure. Directly. Is it, I don't know if you know the answer to this, that with any grant, would it generally be clearly acceptable to use the grant funds to pay that fee? Great question. I'm going to talk about that, actually. Oh. Um, <laughs> I have done that personally. I don't know exactly across all funding agencies if that is allowable. But in particular, as they're moving towards this public access policy, right. I have heard from um, the agencies that this is increasingly OK and acceptable to write into your grant proposals. Yeah. So good segue. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about making your work open in ways that are free. So maybe not necessarily immediately, but at least starting that process towards opening up work into um, the public sphere. And I'll talk about writing this into your grant proposals. Um, so first of all, many open access journals are free. Um, that, I think, is also a misperception that's out there, that they all require a ton of money. A lot of them do require a ton of money, but a lot of them are actually free. And so there is the directory of open access journals. Um, anytime I go to look for an open access journal here, I also cross-reference with Beale's List just to make sure. They, they do a generally pretty good job of not putting those publishers in this resource. But you can search by subject, um, by the language of the journal. You know, 6,400 open access journals, and a lot of them are free. So that is an option um, if you're looking to publish open access and not pay for it. A lot of journals do offer fee waivers. This is particularly important, I think, for early career researchers and graduate students. I know a number of um, students when I was at Davis who asked for a fee waiver and said, I literally don't have the $1,500, and they give them to them. And I can also tell you I serve on the board of directors for PLOS, and we give fee waivers a lot. I see it in our budget every year when I review our financials. So it's a, it's a thing. Like You can actually ask for a fee waiver if you'd like to publish open access. There are a number of scholarship funds. I just mentioned the one at Davis, for example. I know UVM doesn't have a scholarship fund at the moment. Maybe we'll go there one day. I'll just put that on the table. Um, but they're out, they are out there. And you know, I think it's also important to, to not say this is a stigmatized thing, right? It's OK to ask for help. So 83% of authors in this survey of people who had published in open access journals between 2009 and 2011 reported having some sort of fee assistance, right? That's the overwhelming majority who've sought out a scholarship, asked for a fee waiver, you know, tried to not pay for it directly out of their own pocket. Um, and here we go, right here. Write those charges. You can write them into grant proposals. You know, there is that balance there between, you know, you. So a little funding, and we've got to think about how to use it. But that's what I've been doing. I've been putting those charges into my grant proposals. Um, it also helps when you write your grants. You talk about you have to now in your grant proposals, in your data management plan, talk about how your work will be publicly available because of these new policies. So you say I've written the public uh, publication charges into my grant in an effort to make this work open. So um, I think there's a lot of options for funding. This is a really great resource. Um, if you just look, Google PLOS um, open access funds, it's not just for PLOS. PLOS has put together a collection to help anyone understand, based on a drop-down menu of what country you live in, what state, what institution, if there are any scholarship funds available based on where you are. Um, so people could go there, 
institutional programs um, or programs with funders. For example, if your work was funded by a particular agency, they might also allow for you to pay for it. So I'll mention a few other options um, that aren't just uh, published in an open access free journal. So preprint servers are also a really good option. And, and what this means is that when you publish your article, if you publish in a non-open access journal, you still own the copy of your work right before they put it into the pretty format. And you can take that version and put it into one of these open access repositories or preprint servers. So I have done that for publications that I didn't publish in an open access journal. I have taken the copy. It is the fully peer-reviewed copy. The only thing that it isn't is formatted in the nice um, heading in the nice format, and that is what I have put into some of these repositories. So people can still see the peer-reviewed information. I include a link to the original article so they can go and see that it was published. And it's a great way if, especially retroactively, you've got a bunch of work that you did and you didn't publish it open access and you'd like to make it available, this is a really good option. I personally use Figshare, um, but I've also put all of my stuff into ScholarWorks with the help of Elizabeth, and we're working on building an open access food systems collection here um, in that sense. So there's also the institutional repositories like ScholarWorks um, ResearchGate, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, and personal websites. Now, caveat to that, uh, which I'll get to. So when you're doing this self-archiving, it's really important to understand what rights you actually have and what rights you don't have. And the reality is that when most of us go, to, we're so excited, we got a paper accepted, yay, great, and we go to publish it in this Elsevier journal, and they make us read that long, crazy copyright thing that we all just click yes at the bottom to, and then, because we want our paper to get done, we want to get it out. What, we're, you know, what happens in that process, I think, is really important for uh, researchers to educate themselves on. Usually what that means is that you've signed over your copyright to Elsevier, to Wiley, to whoever the publisher is, which means you no longer have the right to put those papers into these places, right? So this is a big challenge and a big misperception I think that's out there is that, oh, I can just put all my papers on ResearchGate and put them on my personal website. You can't actually because you don't own the copyright to them anymore. The publishers own the copyright. And Elsevier has gone after academics and issued cease and desist orders and told them to take down their papers. So they will go after people. Um, it is a problem. So I just want to provide some resources for people to better understand how to know what your rights are. So um, Sherpa Romeo, this website, is a really great resource for people to understand what the journals actually let you do with your work. Um, in Sherpa Romeo, you can go and look at the particular journal. So here I have an example from Global Environmental Change. And here it's telling me I am allowed to put my own preprint, which is pre-peer reviewed, on a personal website, ResearchGate, et cetera. I'm also allowed to put the postprint. So this is the one that's most important, right? Because this is the peer reviewed version. I'm allowed to do that. So if I have that version that I just talked about, the non-pretty formatted version, I'm allowed to put it on ResearchGate, that version. I'm not allowed to put the publisher's version, right? This is what lots of people are doing. They're doing this. And depending on the journal, you may not be able to do that. So it's a really great source to figure out what you can and can't do. And just to sort of highlight this, um, this is screenshots I took yesterday from ResearchGate. So here's the article that I wrote. It was published in that journal, Global Environmental Change. Um, and I, it was published open access. So I actually have the right to put it on ResearchGate. But here's the steps that you go through when you decide to put something on ResearchGate. Step one, share full text publicly. And it says the journal you published in may support self-archiving. Small print, okay, so it's like people maybe don't see that. Okay, then after you say like, yes, I selected it, upload, so here's my version. This is actually the formatted pretty version because I paid for it to be open access from the beginning, which means I still have the copyright. So step two, I've uploaded it. And then it says, I have reviewed and verified the file I'm uploading. I have the right to share the full text publicly and agree to the upload conditions. I was like, what are the upload conditions? <laughs> step four or three, by uploading the file, you confirm you hold the necessary copyright, license, permission, or other rights necessary to publish the work, and that it does not violate the personal rights of another person. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, don't hold research gate, harmful. So this is the step I think a lot of people are missing. I think a lot of people are putting their work up, and I think it's great that we have more articles out there. I just want people to understand they could be targeted for that, that you know, there are, there's a history of the publishers coming after people for doing, doing this stuff. So I just bring it up so that we're, we're clear about that. Um, the third option is, are these hybrid journals. So these are journals that have the option to publish open, um, but they're also sometimes closed. So it's based on the article as opposed to the journal. So some journals are fully open access, period. And then some, like the hybrid, it's depending on the article. So some articles might be open access because they paid and others are closed. The fees can get pretty hefty. Um, the Lancet, $5,000. So disclaimer, um, this option can be quite expensive in particular. OK, so just a little note about what I've done. So I self-archive on Figshare and ResearchGate with the proper rights that um, I just talked about. I have used the hybrid option, paid through grant funds. Um, I've also published in fully open access journals, paid through scholarship funds and grant funds, and I've put my work in both the Harvard repository and the UVM repository. So this is like a screenshot from Figshare. You can go and you can see my public data. You also have to click those things on Figshare to say you have the right to do it. And here's all my different papers um, that I've put in there. So uh, the last thing I'll, I'll reflect on, and then um, we'll have time hopefully for conversation after the other presentations, is Will my work, uh, making my work open access is risky, especially for an early career faculty member? Like, will, will it make my career suffer? Should I tell people that I promote open access? I mean, this last one, frankly, I can't answer yet. I don't have tenure. Um, I'm, I think I'm on a good path. I feel good about it, but we'll see. Um, but so first of all, you know, a lot of open access journals are really highly wet, read and very highly cited. So if, like myself, you're on this tenure track avenue. Um, there's options to try to publish in places that have this sort of traditional measure of impact, right? Um, lots of them have really high impact factors, actually. And there's an increasing number of them available. Second, um, I think it's really interesting that, you know, a lot of other journals are doing this now, too, but open access journals often offer these alternative metrics to think about the impact of your work beyond an impact factor. So this is a screenshot from one of my own articles published in PLOS One. Um, and so it tells you how many total article views that you've had. Here it shows the breakdown between PubMed Central and PLOS, where it was published. It also compares how my article has been viewed compared to other articles, similar fields. So this one lets me see that, oh, this is a more popular article than other articles published around that time. And it tells you how people are citing and saving and sharing your work as well, um, which I think is another way to communicate about the way that you've had an impact. I'm turning in my first round of tenure paperwork on Friday, and I put some of this stuff in my packet to say, like, oh, like, my work has been, you know, viewed this many times, shared this many times, et cetera. It's also, I think, worth noting that there's been peer-reviewed studies done about the fact that open access work helps people see your work and cite it. So there's evidence to suggest that there's a citation advantage for open access work. This European Commission report found a 40% citation advantage for freely accessible papers and a negative 27% citation disadvantage for non-freely accessible papers. There's been a number of peer-reviewed articles um, about this as well, looking at how when work is more publicly available, more people find it and it's cited more frequently. Um, and in my experience, you know, I really feel like this hasn't hurt my career to make my work open. And conversely, in some ways, it's helped people see my work and find me and want to collaborate. And, and, um, and that's been great because I put my work on ResearchGate. Um, I've also had, uh, this was an open access article I published for my dissertation that two years after it's been published is still the number one downloaded article from that journal. And it was open access. I'm not saying it's because it was open access, but I don't know. I didn't think it was like that amazing of an article. So I think, you know, that's helpful potentially. Um, and so for me, at least, it's been a, a positive thing, not necessarily a negative thing. And the, the benefits, I think, are beyond just the personal, right? This idea that you can see how many people view and share your work. But there's also a collection of open access success stories available online to talk about the benefit to the university and the community, and also collections of open access work really for the public good. So there's an open access collection on Ebola, for example, that developed at PLOS um, 
when we had the Ebola outbreak and a number of other really positive benefits like that. So to conclude, I mean, I think for me, when I, when I reflect on, on this especially as a really good example to why do people do research in the first place? And I think most people do it because they want to make a difference. They want their work to have an impact. They genuinely care about making the world a better place. And I, I see that open access can help contribute to that. Um, and that's what I would say, you know, how, can we, how can open access make you know, your research better, all research better, and potentially even the world better? So I'll stop there. And um, I don't know if we want to take questions now or later, but OK, great. So thank you. Questions? I have questions. Sure, Donna. So when you were uh, publishing uh, your that chapter of your dissertation, you mm -hmm. the plots, right? What did your kind of advice did you get from your advisor? Mm -hmm. um, was there a talk about that? Yeah, I, I, I get asked that question a lot. It was the first chapter of my dissertation. Um, actually. It was a really positive experience, and he was really excited. This was 2012. He was really excited about the alternative metrics. He, um, he thought it was really cool that we could like, monitor who was sharing it and how, and how many views there were. And he still sometimes tells me, he's like, do you know that paper that we wrote has like 6,000 views? I mean, he still checks it, I think, like four years later. Um, I can tell you from my experience working with other graduate students around the country, that is not always the case. That conversation can be a lot harder. And, um, you know, I think there are other barriers potentially. I didn't publish my second chapter, Open Access. Um, I've made it Open Access since then with my version of the postprint. But I do think for graduate students, having, if they want to publish Open Access, having that conversation early, talking about why they want to do it, how they might pay for it if that's an issue, you know, just starting that dialogue um, is important. And talking about, you know, some of these other benefits potentially, if that's important to them. For like my PI, it was just he really cared that people <laughs> he cared that people were sharing it on Twitter and like he could monitor that and he just thought that was really cool. So in my case it wasn't a hard conversation. I know that's not always the case though. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so here at UVM, a lot of the open access talk, as you can see today, has been very library-centric. Mm -hmm. um, you've been at a couple of other institutions, UC Davis and Harvard, where yeah. there is <coughs> some faculty-driven mandates and yes. policies and things like that. I'm wondering if you could comment on um, how you see that kind of broader faculty buy-in um, playing out at those campuses and, and possibly some steps we could take here at UVM to um, kind of broaden the discussion. Yeah, well first of all, I'd love to be involved. Um, I said for my first year, I'll just get my feet wet and then now I'm, you know, I'm really excited about that possibility. Um, at, at the UC, it was actually in part driven by uh, graduate students so graduate students pass a resolution at UC Davis uh, promoting open access as a, you know, something they cared about. And so there was sort of a broader, like not just faculty, but also student movement to make that happen. At Harvard, I was only there for a year and they had already passed their policy at that point. But what I can say about the Harvard policy is, you know, with Peter Suber, who is um, sort of their lead person and, and actually one of the lead people in open access in general. He literally wrote the book on how to create an institutional repository. I think in that case it was one person who really um, helped to spearhead that effort. What I think is important is um, helping do things like this and talk about what it means and what it doesn't mean. You know, Middlebury College just passed an institutional repository in June and I think that started to create some conversation among some of my colleagues here because they're so close by and oh maybe that's not such a scary thing um, but I think it honestly you know my experience working with all kinds of people on this topic for a long time you really do often have to start sort of at the beginning because I don't think there is great information out there about what what does this mean for us Can, you know do we have to publish only in open access journals if we have a man you know a repository and I think there's a lot of misperceptions um, 
So I think starting that conversation sometimes at ground zero uh, does have to happen, even if it feels like that's a long way to get to where you go. But I think involving students, undergrad and graduate, is also important. And I think for the undergraduate students, I'll, I'll just say, uh, they don't quite realize when they leave, they lose all of their library privileges. And all of a sudden, like you know, six months later, they're, oh my gosh, I have access to nothing. Um, so I think that for undergraduate students in particular, this is a potentially really powerful um, community to engage as well.